You'd think that the way I eat 555 timer chips for breakfast and use them so extensively in both projects and teaching that I'd give you the lowdown on how to do the math to use them in the circuits that you're designing. Well, I failed. <laughs> and many of you had asked uh, how I came up with the resistor and capacitor values that I used in the circuits in this course. So let me give you the lowdown here. And there are two downloadable cheat sheets in the downloads section. Now, if you recall, the 555 can be set up in monostable mode to send out a single pulse with a specific time set by the resistor and capacitors. Or you can build up in a stable mode where it sends out a pulse train with a frequency determined by the resistors and capacitor. So one cheat sheet is for monostable mode. The other cheat sheet is for a stable mode. Choose your weapon when you go to design a circuit. Let's look at the monostable mode first. I've got the circuit schematic here for you and a quick reference chart with the pulse time pulse width time, the capacitor value here, and various resistor values here. Now, I have to give a shout out and credit to one of the greats in electronics here, Forrest Mims III. Now, Forrest was a huge inspiration to countless people, including myself. Uh, he had published a series of engineers notebooks through Radio Shack in the 80s. And one of the little books was the 555 Timer Handbook. And right at the start of that book, he had two charts similar to these. Uh, these are not his charts, but rather I made these. But his charts were my inspiration for building these charts because I constantly found myself going straight to his charts. So mine are similar to his, but expanded and greatly, uh, but expanded greatly. And the A stable chart is corrected as he used a slightly different formula for his chart. So how this works with monostable mode is determine what length your pulse needs to be. Uh, are you turning something on for 10 seconds and then off? Let's go with 10 seconds. So here's the 10 seconds on the chart. Just to keep it simple, I'll follow the 10 second line up. Uh, here's a handy junction with a resistor of one mega ohm and a capacitor of 10 microfarads. I'll get a delay of just a little over 10 seconds. Now, if you do the math, it's actually 11 seconds, but we're in the ballpark. Now, I must emphasize this is approximate. Bear in mind that a one meg resistor with a 5% accuracy will have an actual value of between 950K and 1.05 mega ohms, a difference of as much as 100,000 ohms. That's a pretty significant difference, which will change your pulse time accordingly. Now, for the vast majority of your projects, this is perfectly acceptable. If I need precision timing, I'll get it close and then I'll incorporate a pot. I'll actually measure the time and adjust the pot until I get the time, until the time is what I want. Now, the actual formula to calculate the pulse time is 1.1 times R times C. Now, R is in ohms and C is in farads. Notice this number is not microfarads, which is the most common scale used for capacitors, but our formula uses farads. So 100 microfarads in the formula would be 0 0.0001 farads, right? So the monostable timer is triggered by pin two going low. It is what we call leading edge triggered. So pin two is held high and the moment it goes low, the output goes high and the timer starts. 
So pin two will have to go high again before you can trigger the pulse the next time. I regret that in the past lessons I was confusing in my descriptions of how the circuit worked. So pin two, the trigger is triggered by the leading edge of a pulse going low. Okay, let's take a look at the A-stable circuit. Here's the schematic. By tying pin 2 and 6 to the positive side of the capacitor, the 555 now becomes self-triggering. But recall that the capacitor charges up through R1 and R2. But when the capacitor charges up above the positive trigger voltage, a transistor gets turned on inside the chip, connecting pin 7 to ground. This discharges the capacitor through R2 only. As a result, you can change the pulse width by modifying the resistor values. Now, once again, I must apologize for any confusion I've caused previously because of the way I explain things. It is better to think of the output as being high normally and the pulses themselves going low. So while the capacitor is charging up, the output is high. As the capacitor is being discharged, the output goes low. So because of this, the low time is typically shorter than the high time because it's the same capacitor on each part of the cycle, but the charging current has to go through two resistors while the discharging current only has to go through one resistor. So varying the resistor ratios varies the pulse width but not the frequency. The frequency is determined by the total resistance of R2 and R1 combined with the value of C1. Now the actual formula to determine the frequency is frequency equals 1.44 over R1 plus 2 R2 times C where R1 and R2 are in ohms, and C is, again, in farads. R2 factors into the equation twice, because the current through to the capacitor has to go through R2 twice, first while charging the capacitor, then the second time when the capacitor discharges. So here's another quick reference chart to help determine the frequency of the output in cycles per second or hertz relative to the capacitor value and the sum of R1 and R2. So you want a frequency of, oh, one kilohertz. There's the one kilohertz line, a capacitor of 0.1 microfarads and a total resistance of just a little less than 10K will get me close. Now, again, I must emphasize this is approximate. Nine times out of 10, this is all I need. If I need precise frequency, I'll put a pot on there and I'll slap a frequency meter on the output and adjust it till I get what I need. Now, quite a few 555s can run up to two megahertz or more. In fact, there are some versions that can run up to five megahertz. So bearing in mind how the charge discharge cycle works relative to the output wave gives you an opportunity to customize the output wave form. Specifically, you can modulate the pulse width. If I make R2 really big compared to R1, uh, say R2 is 10K and R1 is 100 ohms, the capacitor will charge up through 10,100 ohms and will discharge through 10,000 ohms. Do you think the charge discharge times will be that different? Well, of course not. The two times will be within 1% of each other because time one is the discharge time and time two is the charge time, these pulses will be virtually identical. The larger R2 is compared to R1, the more perfect a square wave you will get. 
Now, if you're like me, you might well ask the question, well, why do we have R1 in there at all? If you replace it with a wire, you'll have a perfect uniform square wave. And when I asked this of my professors in college, they didn't have an answer. <laughs> and isn't it interesting that in my college robotics course, we had entire classes just on the 555 timer. That's how important, useful, and used this silly chip is in industry and electronics. Okay, the short answer is you must have a resistor between pin seven and positive, and here's why. Remember that during the discharge cycle, pin seven gets connected through to ground through a transistor. Oops, you put a wire in place of R1 and that's now a dead short between positive supply and ground through your 555. And your microchip quickly becomes a beautiful black crater on your circuit board. So if you want a uniform square wave output, just make R2 as big as possible relative to R1, though I probably wouldn't go smaller than say 100 ohms on R1, here's why. If I'm using a 12 volt supply and say a 10 ohm resistor for R1, during the discharge cycle, 12 volts will be dropped across that 10 ohm resistor. 12 divided by 10 is 1.2 amps that the power supply will push through both through that resistor and the chip. Both will probably get hot and burn out. Okay, let's play with the pulse width modulation a bit. By making R1 larger, my charge time increases, and thus so does the high time of the output pulse. The bigger R1 is relative to R2, the shorter the pulse time gets, and the longer the high time gets. Now you can do like I did in the PWM circuit and put a diode right across R2. So when it discharges, the discharge time is almost instantaneous. So your waveform will look like this, with the low pulse being just a blip. Now, making the low portion of the wave longer than the high is a little trickier, but it can be done with diodes and resistors. By putting two opposing diodes, feeding the capacitor through two different resistances, you can control the charge and discharge times. By making R1 fairly small, R2 will be the charge time resistor, R3 will set the discharge time. So in my example here, charging resistor resistance will be about 10,100 ohms, while the discharge resistance will be about 100,000, 10 times as much. So the output stays low all the time the capacitor is discharging through this resistor. The larger the discharge resistor is relative to the charging resistors, the longer the low side of the pulse. Now, please note though, this does affect the frequency, however. 100K total resistance with say a 0.1 microfarad capacitor will produce a frequency of about 90 Hertz. But on the charge cycle, you've got roughly 10,000 ohms with the same capacitor, which will produce a 900 Hertz frequency, very different. So the average frequency will be, you know, some combination of the two times. So this is why in my PWM circuits, I used two timers. One to set the pace with a steady frequency, while the other produces a width modulated pulse triggered by the pulses from the frequency, frequency generator. The frequency was steady regardless of the pulse width. Lastly, there is the NE556 timer, which I'll just mention in passing. Uh, take a look at the data sheet. Notice it has all the exact same pins of the 555, only two sets of pins. 
That's because the 556 is simply two 555 timers in one package. So you can transcribe a circuit using two 555s into a circuit using one 556. Just transcribe the original the the pin designations of the original two chips to transfer over to the 556. Okay, I hope that helps and I hope that answers the questions that so many of you had.